Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Al Atia Foundation podcast. My name is Stephen Cole. Today, we're joined by Dr. Valerie Marcel, an associate fellow at Chatham House and founder of the New Producers Group, which is a knowledge sharing network of over 30 emerging uh, and oil gas producing countries. So hello, Valerie. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, not at all. Um, Valerie, where else can we begin but with COP26? There's, there's already been some criticism directed at the overall organization, but what is your overall impression of what has been organized and what might happen? Well, I can't speak too much to the organization, um, just reading, you know, what I read in the papers about Glasgow's lack of hotels and whatnot. But I, I think what I'm really looking uh, and what I'm really looking forward to in, in this COP is, is seeing an important issue addressed on equity. Uh, I think there's a lot of small uh, emerging developing countries that have not receive the support that was promised to them. And I'm I'm watching carefully to see whether that issue gets the right kind of prominence that it needs in this, uh, in this COP. Indeed, uh, I've already talked to uh, Malawi, uh, Namibia, uh, and uh, uh, a few other smaller countries. And this is exactly what they're saying, the economic fallout from uh, tackling climate change. Uh, just one more question on COP26. I don't want to go on because we're going to be reading about it and hearing about it so much. But the British Prime Minister has said, uh, in his words, there are no compelling excuses now for what he calls our procrastination. Um, do you agree with him? Well, I can't, you know, I, I can't stop myself from just smiling sometimes when I hear the, those kinds of comments, because of course the UK is still licensing for oil and gas exploration. Norway is, Canada, the US. And so there is a double standard there that, uh, that, I, that I, I don't think um, gives them the right to, to lecture uh, most of the world. And so that's why I think this equity issue is about access to finance, but it's also about, um, you know, I think the most developed countries changing course in, in a very, you know, in a very sharp turn. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting to see what kind of real commitments are made from the most uh, developed countries. Uh, you and everybody else, I think, Valerie. But your area of work at Chatham House focuses on knowledge sharing between oil and gas producers in the Southern Hemisphere. What would you say the challenges are associated with that role, considering the major northern hemisphere producers hold much of the cutting edge technology? Yes, well, in fact, I think what we see in our group is that the most valuable knowledge that 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 can be imparted to the governments of developing countries that are just starting in the oil and gas sector is actually, you know, the experience of having had to uh, you know, establish new institutions, uh, draft new policies. So, in fact, more than the technical knowledge, I think it's really about hearing from Uganda, the government of Uganda, how how they reacted after they had discoveries, how they managed the public expectations that were growing out of control, how they how they established institutions when they have really under resourced um, uh, civil service. So I think it's much more impactful, really, to hear from each other, uh, government to government, than to hear from, you know, the consultant from the Western capital that comes in with best practice and a lot of technical knowledge. That best practice doesn't really, um, that isn't successfully implemented uh, in these countries because it doesn't take, it doesn't understand that the resource constrained reality that they face. So I think there's a lot more to learn from each other uh, than, than technical information that doesn't translate or apply well in country. Well, a lot of research and development goes into developing cutting edge technology. So the main difficulty must be that people want to hold on to their intellectual property and they don't want to share it. Well, yes, absolutely. But I think, you know, you have to think that 
in 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 the countries that we're talking about, um, the governments don't don't ever see that technology. Their their oil sector is completely operated by foreign oil companies that make they make the technical decisions, they apply the technology, and the role of the government is to oversee them, make sure that they're not inflating costs for which they have absolutely no, they have no uh, benchmarks to, to actually assess that. So they're quite blind in this. Um, so in a sense, they have to trust that the companies are just doing the best that can be done. Yes. Um, and what they can, what's under their control is perhaps more um, creating incentives for best practice by the oil companies in the way that they devise their regulations or their laws uh, um, and their policies. That's, that's more what they can control. So that's why that issue of policy and policy implementation is in a sense more important than technology. Yeah, good point. Do oil and gas producers of the Southern Hemisphere share knowledge readily or is there a measure of parochialism here, i.e. withholding some information? Yes, it's it's really interesting. I think that, you know, the way we structure our discussions is that we will often ask in advance of, uh, of some officials who we know are are willing sharers to, to just step up and, and start and start the, the dance or the ball. And so when the others see all of the, you know, this very senior official is speaking quite candidly about the challenges that he or she faces in reality, um, it really, you know, makes them feel comfortable and emboldened to, to share as much. But, and so we do find that there is really a willingness to share because, you know, especially if you think of a country like Guyana, for example, that discovered massive amounts of oil in 2015, yeah. they were completely overwhelmed and they didn't know at all about what to what to do next. What was the yes, first step? That, that's the a second very good step. example. Yeah. What's the what how and what why? And so they uh, benefited from uh, you know incredibly generous um, sharing from Uganda, for example. Um, and and so they can then pass it on to someone else. And now the next the next country in our group that's made big discoveries is Suriname. And so there's a bit of a chain of, of sharing that way. But you do see that there are some countries that are particularly good at sharing and that's, it goes to their national culture to some extent because so I mentioned Uganda, Ghana uh, is another one that, that shares very well. Um, and there are some that are that are maybe you know by their natural national culture a little more um, of the view that perhaps a bit more shy to speak up, um, mm. and they may feel that knowledge is power as well, and so yes. you retain it. Um, and so they're not, you know, I think that they're not um, in a way they listen to conversations more than they share. But on the whole, I think we find that we have we have a good a good exchange in the group. What what sort of knowledge uh, is exchanged? Uh, is it focused on policy recommended or or uh, technical knowledge? I'd say it's mostly policy, um, but uh, it is also technical. I, I think a lot of the most interesting information that's been shared has been around how to manage the relationship with. An oil company, um, because as I mentioned before, there's that asymmetry of power and knowledge. The governments really don't know very much about the oil sector. Uh, they may have, when they've discovered oil or gas, they may have one geologist in their whole, you know, or one petroleum engineer in their whole government, um, and they're facing a company that has, uh, you know, thirty. 30,000 employees, thousands of lawyers. Um, and so they're, they're quite bullied by the companies. And so one of the most useful things that they can learn from each other is how to push back, how to ask, what to ask for, what, what they're entitled to, to get from an oil company in terms of information, for example. Um, so I think that kind of exchange is really valuable. And then there's also the whole gamut of questions around, well, how, you know, how do I, 
what regulations are appropriate for oil spill preparedness, or how do I um, how do I manage public expectations um, when the politicians are clamoring and uh, <laughs> and making all sorts of promises to everybody that we cannot um, that we can't fulfill. So those kinds of I think it's often those kinds of areas that'll be shared the most. Uh, just a, a, a quick uh, observational question: The new producers group aren't members of OPEC uh, or the GECF, and only a few have observer status. Why is that? Well, I think that they they are they are. It's not really in their interest to participate in these uh, organizations. They don't have the might that comes from the volumes of oil and gas produced to influence price through these organizations uh, or to affect decision making in them. We have a lot of members of our group that haven't yet started producing. Uh, so there some of them are sort of, you know, stalling in the development or post-discovery stage. And so they don't have the production that would you know, warrant them their participation. So I'm thinking of Mozambique and Tanzania, for example, that have um, had gas resources that haven't been developed yet, even though they have, you know, big reserves. Um, I don't think it would make sense for them. And also, yeah. you know, if you think of the energy transition and the fact that they have, they calculate they may have 10, 20, 30 years ahead of them, um, their interest would probably be to just pump without the constraints of, a, of an organization right. like that. that. That sort of makes sense. I, earlier, just uh, taking you back a bit to Guyana, and you, you talked about sort of the, the wealth that was created. Um, for many of your small producers, oil and gas wealth can bring the so-called Dutch disease, where the discovery of a natural resource can perhaps damage or possibly harm the wider economy. Is part of your project to discuss how to spend the newfound wealth wisely? And how can producers escape the trap of creating a rentier economy? Yes, very much. I, I think that's a big focus. Um, a lot of the group is, you know, has has watched Nigeria in particular. And we have often had, Nigeria has participated in a lot of our meetings saying very frankly, just don't do what we did. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they have a very, you know, frank self-reflection. Um, and the rest of the group sees that, you know, the dangers of the rentier economy uh, in terms of the dependence on, on the revenues, but also the sort of governance and political failures that come um, with the development of a big resource like that. And so, yes, there is really an, uh, a lot of thinking around how to how to do things differently. Um, and and I think there's several members, interestingly, who are quite focused on using the oil and gas revenues to fund green growth. Uh, so that's uh, Guyana and Suriname, though the the change in since the change in governments, it's not clear whether that focus will be as strong. But I think that in what we had in our discussions is a lot of um, a lot of focus on how you can use the you basically would export your oil and gas, use the revenues to fund uh, low carbon um, development paths, whether it's you know renewable energy yeah. or more competitive sectors in in a carbon constrained world. That, that's good synergy. Uh, a lot of the examples we've talked about so far are African, but half your members are African or, or part of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Have the recent cuts in UK overseas aid had any impact on your members and your work? Yes, I, it hasn't had a, an impact on our organization because we don't get funding from the UK government, uh, but it has certainly affected um, the members of the group, the governments. And I'd say even beyond the UK uh, pull out or pull back, it's, it's generally Western development agencies that are really reluctant uh, now to support, uh, support governments in their management of their new resources, oil, their new oil and gas resources. It's sort right. of like a distasteful kind of sector that um, that it's that becomes difficult for them to justify to their public, say, well, why are why are we supporting a government 
to develop new oil and gas resources when we have a climate crisis. Yeah. But I think yeah, it's short-sighted. They're very sensitive, aren't they? Yes, exactly. I think it's short-sighted because I think these governments do really need support to avoid that resource curse. Um, your, your areas of interest and studies are sub-Saharan Africa, East Mediterranean, the Caribbean, uh, all the places I like to go on holiday. All these areas also, and the reason I like to go on holiday, have great potential for solar power. Is this something you're advising on and is a suggestion of increasing solar power generation accepted by your uh, NOC contacts? Yes, I think the countries in our group are very keen to invest in uh, in renewable energy generally, and uh, they find it somewhat challenging to access the the finance support that was that's supposed to be promised from the Paris Agreement to be able to to really invest in that. Um, I think, but they find it the the, fun, the funding is you know increasingly available. So yes, I think there's great interest in that and. And I think it's a great way to distract their publics from, you know, the excessive focus on oil and gas as the uh, the, the sort of savior of the economy um, and to really see that renewables are affordable and obviously much cleaner and, and they'll have a longer shelf life in these countries. So, no, there's great interest in that. In telecommunications and banking, um, it's been possible with the new technologies available to bypass those expensive uh, infrastructure costs that many developed countries have as a legacy. Is that possible with local energy sources? Yes, we're really looking at that leapfrogging um, sort of, you know, the, the opportunities for leapfrogging. And in fact, our, our, our webinar series this year is called, Leap, uh, sorry, Forging a New Path. Um, and it's really looking at how if you're if you're a country that's just discovering oil and gas now and you know there's this energy transition, you know that you have suddenly a, a ticking clock, you make decisions differently. And so you don't want to lock in to the same kind of, um, you know, whole petroleum value chain, the um, the infrastructure um, you don't want to lock into a consumption that's not sustainable. You just think about things differently if you know that you this is your one chance. Um, and I think it's in a way it's a precious opportunity um, to 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 avoid a lot of the mistakes made uh, made elsewhere. Well, Dr. Valerie, that's all we have time for uh, for today. Uh, on behalf of the Alatea Foundation, I'd like to thank you very much for joining me for this interview and forging a new path ahead and providing the foundation with uh, some very expert opinion. And the foundation looks forward very much to speaking to you again in the future. And thank you for listening. Uh, see you next time for another Alatea Foundation podcast. From me, Stephen Cole, goodbye.